This episode of Snake and Banter on its new home at Insight on Esports channel is presented by Esports Bet, which is the new name for DJ Esports. And they have all the CS score you could want to bet on because they are the industry's leading esports crypto odds matrix. So if you click on the CS score tab, you will see here they've got the LPL, which is Chinese CS score. They've got Portuguese CS score. They've got Dust2.dk. I'm assuming that's Danish. They've got ESEA for America. They've got the ESL Challenger League. They've got ESL Impact, which is that GG for all women's tournament. They've got ESL Pro League, which is ongoing at the time it's recording. They've got the PGL RMR for Americas. They've got the Polish League. They've got all kinds of leagues you could basically want. So if you want to bet on CS score and you already do or are interested in it, why not check out Esports Bet? Right, this is going to be another episode of Snake and Banter, the show that me and Maui Snake do. Obviously, we've reversed the dynamics now. I'm just a lowly YouTuber with diminishing numbers, trying to make it, never getting on ready, just getting hit on all the time. Told I know nothing about the game. Now, Maui Snake does all the big majors and the big events, gets all the gigs, potentially shills for companies, defends and attacks the ones that don't hire him. You know, it's, it's like I had to pass the mantle on. You know, eventually it comes time to pass the torch and someone else can burn the whole scene. Right, obviously our guest for this one is Launders, who hopefully is going to be his first major coming up. Because somehow, actually that's one thing I want to ask you about briefly, Launders. How would you actually describe this part? Because one thing I thought was on the one hand like a bit unfair, but I did see like a logic behind it. I agree, right? I actually think you should have been hired for the PGL Stockholm major. I think if you just look at the years before and the status that you had, even I'd say also, by the way, just a through line on the games, you casted all the bloody blast finals and stuff. Like to me, like logically you had a place in the game. But at the same time, I, I did try to make a point on the shores that if you're coming purely from the TO side, you guys kind of did hit the top during the online period though right so i wanted to get at you just briefly before we get into the show and all the, the the normal structure what were your thoughts in that regard like for example did you actually think that like you had you earned a shot should you've got a shot in that regard what did you think yeah, it was actually the first major where i felt like i was good enough to cast the major so before that i never really felt like i had uh, like earned a place it didn't actually matter to me like getting hired or not because that's i mean i've been in this game for so long like it doesn't come down to that sometimes you get the job sometimes you don't yeah sure no big deal anyone who thinks they should get hired for it's like what like what you know where what world do you live in like how long you've been doing this so for me it didn't really matter but just per like on personal level yeah i did feel like during 2020 was when actually we got really good and then it happened to translate really well to land like when we did the, the blast fall final but uh before that i think just as commentators we just weren't that good i don't know think it had a product of going online i don't think that mattered we just had put in enough work over time and eventually it got to the point where we were good enough so now i just feel like i'm good enough to do majors but yeah 2019 before i didn't even feel like i was good enough to do one so i don't wasn't unhappy, fair enough tired. i'll even say by the way as an actual general pattern that you'll notice in the industry people have worked behind the scenes it's actually always the good people by the way who have like skepticism about their own work and like am i actually at the right level yeah i mean so all the ones who think they should be there from day one, they're all the morons who just aren't good, mate, because their premises, they really are the Dunning-Kruger motherfuckers who just can't tell the difference between them and, like, Sadikist or something. And, you know, to anyone who knows, like, the skill set, it's like, mate, it's night and day. So, fair play, though. At least you, you still have, a, like, a reflective take on it. You didn't feel entitled. By the way, if you get the, if you get the gig now, congrats. You deserve it. Right, let's Thanks. get into the episode. So, obviously, we do the format, the good, the bad, the ugly. And on this one, we start with our guest, as always. So, Lorders, what was your good point um uh, my good point is furia actually because uh like right now of course if they, they just won their uh quarterfinal match in the uh in pro league which is pretty impressive but overall furia as a team i thought they were going to kind of fall into obscurity again because they had kept drop which felt like he was an emergency replacement but he seems to be working really well they got safe who almost stats wise nearly was able to get into top 20 last year. So actually, one of maybe the only offers that could replace Henny actually made it onto the team and it made sense. When I personally believe that Henny was actually the best player to get back, where most of the time, if a player leaves a team, just go go to new pastures. I didn't know where else Furia could go. Safe makes a lot of sense. And right now, Art is on a form that is allowing Furia to win a lot of their games. If he's getting... Basically, he's got over 20 kills in every single series that they've played, and they've won every single one except for the one he didn't get 20 kills in right now. So his high vol volatility, you know, Kerrigan style of play is working really well right now from Furia. And the pieces in between, Yuri and Caserato, are always consistent. So now we have Furia as a real contender team. And they've also spent about a year 
in a zone where they're good enough to be top 10. Everybody knows how they play and they have actually changed their play style to be more typical of other teams. Like they have still have like a little bit of fury of flavor, but they're not like overtly aggressive like they were back in 2019. They weren't playing like an underdog. And actually one of their biggest rivals was Astralis because they were the most perfect team and the team that they said they didn't want to play like because if they did, right. then they would end up losing because they weren't good enough. Now they're a team who can actually play regular tier one Counter-Strike with a little bit of extra aggressive flavor and take down teams like Astralis, just beating them on their own terms. So right now I feel like uh, <coughs> Furia got into the last major because they got lucky with the RMR points being from NA getting into top eight. But now they could actually earn their way into playoffs and I don't think it'd be a surprise. In fact, I think if they keep this form, they could be looking at top four. I, I think Furia's success has to definitely do with the fact, but like you said, they still have some of the flair. Like Art is still going for a lot of openers, and he draws a lot of plays for himself. But I think what really helps them out is that Yuri is pro is he's like the best right hand man that Art could possibly have when he's going for map control. He always seems like he's ready for the trade, and even and even sometimes Yuri ends up in a position just because of the way the nades go or just kind of whatever happens around. Like maybe Art gets semi blind or something. He's always there to pick up the slack if Art messes up that opening duel. Art, Art's been doing fantastically in openers at Pro League. Uh, the play and I I love that. Furia just seem to always find ways to reinvent their openers. I think that's something that probably other teams just should be copying them a lot more in terms of if we can take space and sure, we might go one for one on it. But on T side, you're, you're going to take that every time you, you need to be comfortable taking those kinds of risks. So I I right now, actually, weirdly enough, safe has been a guy that hasn't hasn't really impressed me as much as I thought he would have by now. And, and that's kind of mm. con, that's kind of actually concerning but also means that their ceiling could even be higher than what we're seeing right now which is cool uh you know they, they still haven't lost yet in pro league by the time we're recording this one and so just taking down astralis that's definitely an impressive <coughs> victory but i think that the most slept on player is probably drop in my eyes i think he plays some pretty difficult roles that I, and I actually think that he does it better than than Vinny did. I actually am am now willing to say that on record that I think he's better than Vinny in a lot of different situations. I'd say probably Inferno is still the one map that Vinny was just better at than than Drop. But I think. Do you think he got some of his roles when Vinny left? He got some of Vinny's roles. Uh, he took some of those over. So, like for example, Drop was like an A rifler in the Academy League team, and now I think Drop has to play banana with Caserato, if i'm not mistaken so i don't okay. i don't think he gets all the same roles so he had to learn a lot of new stuff that he wasn't getting on the academy roster so for him to be just be performing at a level that's just competent <coughs> that's very impressive for me because he's a guy with very little experience overall yeah and you watch him play and he just makes like some correct decisions in a row the other thing i wanted to say about fury was that like they kind of they always did have that underdog mentality of like, oh, we just, you know, we've got to be different. But if you look at Yuri and Caserato, and I, I want to make this argument that just watching them uh, in these past few years, that these are two of the best players Brazil has ever produced, like accomplishments aside. For like sure. if we talk about you know all the greats on SK and Illuminosity, that's whatever. But they are up there, even though Furia haven't been able to compete at the same level or win the same amount of events. They are every bit as good. And I think they could have even fit on that old SK lineup and you wouldn't have even have noticed. I really think that team would have still win with those two players. So that that's why I think they got to stop playing like underdogs. And yeah, Drop was like, it felt like an interim player, just an emergency change. He would get swapped out. And that's probably why I got all these hard rolls in the first place. But you watch him play. He makes like correct decisions almost every round. His aim's not super nuts, but he's good enough. And they already have so much firepower that they don't need Drop to be that player. <clears throat> Yeah, I think Fury is mega, mate. Like, I even remember when I just saw this roster, when they, when they it was just announced they were going to pick up safe. I was amazed how many people didn't get hyped. I get it, sort of, because it's part of the problem I think they had. Because it reminds me of when VP did the flit swap, actually. It's because you're only changing one player. A lot of fans seem really lost on this key point, I think, about how teams are structured. Which is, it's actually, if you do the right swap, it, you're never doing a one-for-one -one trade. The best trade is the trade where you not only, like, upgrade the position, but it, like, has 
has a knock on like second and third order effect on other people on the team. Like it puts someone else in a better position or removes a responsibility from someone or it just makes like, for example, say you had loads of aggressive players and now you've got like a great passive player. It might be maybe balances you out and like makes the identity more versatile. To me, that's the reason why this move, I think, is mad slept on. Because when I saw this roster announced, yes, I get it. You had the Vitality announcement and you had the G2. You know, we're sexier ones. But I remember thinking, dude, Furio was already like a nice, like canny little dark horse team, even with the squad last year. Like you saw just from that trio you talk about now, it was still very good. Art, K, Serato and Yuri. That trio alone could go head to head with any other threesome in CSGO and was actually pretty good. Obviously, their problem was scoffed up and then dropped. Just I would even say just hadn't been bedded in yet. Was, that was basically the first year he was playing with the team. People forget he was like replaced not that long, like at the beginning of the year, basically. So I think if you look at this team now... The safe guy hasn't even actually come online yet. He's barely had any games that were like when he was in pain. But you see, already he's just such an upgrade overall. The rest of the team hasn't seemingly been affected negatively. It hasn't had like a knock-on effect and ruined them. They're still just as good. So I actually think already Fury is probably a little bit slept on as a dark horse. Like, I think for some people, it's a surprise how far they've already made it in Pro League to make it to the semis, you know. I personally think that's reasonable if you look at the bracket. I think they, sh they should be a team in that position. So to me, I think they can be even better. I already think the map pool's pretty nice as well. Like, you look at them, they, they played so many different maps. They actually look like they're also willing to mix up the veto depending on who they're playing. And then the last thing for me is, even right now, they've got pretty good firepower. So if they ever get safe, even 5 or 10% better than this, he doesn't have to be what he was on pain. Because I'm going to assume on pain they probably built the whole team around him and gave him looks that he's not getting on a team where you've got like a pair of star riflers I'm sure Orsi's having a similar experience in Team Liquid right now that's what happens when the stars are the rifle pair mate but I think like you look at the team the, the upside on this team is mega like if we're going to count this like they did back in the days like an NA region team obviously from South America they're the best not only should they be the best they should have the best potential as well this team should be better than Liquid it's like a better version of Liquid this team actually low key especially if the drop angle is actually as you say if you think it's really fit Next. Then they've got a complete team. Like I even I totally agree with the art point, by the way. Here's the problem people have. Art style used to like inform how the whole team played. He still does all the same shit. He just does it individually now. And in fact, now the joke is people think of him doing like crazy T side pushes. Now it's, he's more like a hampers. It's more the CT pushes mm -hmm. that the genius shit he does. That's where he just like hampers, like adds an extra dimension. You know, like if if you can actually have a guy do that, like it, it, it is a massive boon to your team. So yeah, in my opinion, there's so many things that are upside for this team. I struggle to find many downsides. Really, I think the only real downside is the one they've always had, which is you have to sort of go back to the American region and then come back to Europe. You're not permanently in Europe. But aside from that, I also add in the one last re reason why I'm actually now even more hyped for this lineup. Because not only do I think right now it's good and it can get a bit better with the orping, but you look at what is about to happen and we're all trying desperately not to notice that they are probably going to strip out all these brilliant CIS teams slash reformulate them slash sell players. Mate, if any of those teams disappear for good, if Navi loses a player, if Gambit splits up, if VP splits up, this team team is instantly like top five status like they can be right there guys they could be like contending for titles like if the scene got gets chopped out like that they're one of the benefactors for my money so i, th I think all this all the signs are pointing great for this team yeah there's that and there's also the fact that uh beyond the cis issues that's a huge one that's also going to put an asterisk on you know whoever's the best team oh, of course next. Yes. but i mean for teams like furia they're like hell yeah like why not this is an opportunity for us but then there's also you know nip have problems vitality have problems astralis sure. have problems like there's other teams in this top 10 like right now furia are 11 which is kind of ridiculous just there's a lot of teams ahead of them are scoffed right i'm with you yeah exactly like even ends is above them right now like that yes. seems seems like almost a matter of time before they're getting like top six again maybe with the amount of instability in the top 10, even outside of the CIS problems. And those ones are terrible. And I'll just say as a general rule anyway, any team that is willing to play Vertigo, Overpass and Ancient, I'm already very interested. Because if people still haven't figured that out, if you can play all three of those maps, you can always, in Pro Counter-Strike, get a favourable best of three matchup unless you're playing like Prime Navi. That's it. Like, if you're playing any other team in the scene, there's going to be one of those maps they don't like. So they either have to ban it against you, which you just get extra room in the veto, or they have to play it. So it's one of those areas I've always thought is mad underrated. Like, it's all well and good being in that pack that everyone's in of like, I like Inferno, Nuke, and Mariah. It's like, everyone does, you idiot. Now you have to be by far the best. If you can master 
of the three I just mentioned. You, you don't even have to be the best. You can just pick them off when that's like their third worst map all the time. So I even think there's an element there, by the way. I've noticed at the moment they don't seem as ruthless as they could be in their map veto. Like, I, I, I'm a, a, a spoiler. This will probably be a point later, but I'm just waiting for the teams to figure out. You don't do real map vetoes against Astralis. You just ban fucking ancient. So Config's yeah, like yeah, half yeah. as good a player. I don't know how that still hasn't gotten through. That's like a memo that hasn't gotten through the fax machine or something at this point in time, but it'll get there eventually. So we'll wait for that, right? Let's go to the next point. Mouse State, what was your good point? Uh, and all I'll say is I'm going to set this up. This one is <laughs> mad self-indulgent. So just get ready. Listen, Lonis, you came with like a real point about teams. You know, the world's... Get, get ready for what his good point is. On his own show, let's hear what it's going to be. It's going to be something oh, really important. So, so get ready. Chill. Come I'm on, come on. I'm such G- a, come on, give us I'm it. What is your a, point? I'm such a disgusting chill for all the all the trash I talked about ESL for so long. Uh, okay, ESL Pro League, what they did in Dusseldorf for the for the setup is fantastic. It's the, it's the best setup I've ever been in by far. <laughs> It's like it's easily the best setup I've been. Wait a like, second, because here's the problem: they're gonna think you mean in the stadium with the stuff. You mean just for yourself and like the hotels and shit, right? <laughs> well, basic. Well, basically, okay. So here's here's how it was. Basically, for the first two weeks of pro league, I was working the desk, and I was working in Katowice. We're in the same place that they're doing IEM Katowice in. It's it's whatever. I mean, it's a giant warehouse. It's pretty bare bones. Like you feel kind of sad just looking. A lot of people are fan of there, perhaps. And that's not just me and the obvious callback. Like actually, it's a famous thing. People oh, the cope the co- from other talent. In they the privately bitch so a bit. The yeah. cool space now is just so. It's oh, so sad. By the way, that in low key, that is actually the worst thing I ever did in CS:GO. Is I've now made it that you all have to like gaslight yourselves that it's just fine, you know, like because you don't want to get thawed. You're all just so scared of that. It's like no, no, I love Katowice. <laughs> <laughs> like no, nah, give me a break. Like everybody, hey, like, you oh, have to understand. Even people from Poland would tell you, yeah, sorry, that good coming like Warsaw or Krakow or something, you know, like <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> So Katowice has like one. So nice contrast street. it then. Come on. It has it has one nice street. It's it's like okay. Pe- you you can you can like Katowice if you're there for one week. But once you're yeah. there longer than that, you run out of stuff to do pretty quickly. Or you just want to go to um to Krakow. You want to go to Krakow, honestly. So basically, the setup that they have in Dusseldorf is they put a they put us in this hotel with all the players. Uh, the the catering for all the meals is just fantastic like really like you can eat really healthy and it's delicious so basically if you can eat healthy and it tastes good you already know they're doing something right and basic and three days that's actually week, very rare for people who don't know like it's very common that like catering is either sort of like cafeteria style like one option yeah. or that yeah. it's just some unhealthy shit like a bunch of fries and fucking chicken nuggets like so actually that's low key important if you're like a player or talent yeah you, you're on the road all the time you want to have a chance to eat real food right there's like four main dishes that they have every single day or for every meal for every meal not every day every meal has four okay. main dishes they have a huge they had a really solid salad bar they had a couple pickled things like all, like different olives and cheeses and just like a spread that you can put together if you want uh, and then on Tuesdays Thursdays and Saturdays, there was a guy that did barbecue every day right there <laughs> right. In, on the edge of the stadium. So, and also they're playing, they're actually playing soccer right there. And so you, you step outside. Oh, in the stadium? Yes, in the stadium. Oh, right. I wasn't aware there was games going on, right? Fair yeah, there's games cool. going on. There's, I, I think it's hell. like tier two Bundesliga or right. something, but, but basically you can still just watch it. And that, so that's pretty awesome. And then also on like Friday nights, they had, they had like this co- make your own cocktail, uh, just like masterclass okay. thing. So, so basically like I couldn't even. I couldn't do it. I was casting a game at that time, but I got the talent, the talent manager to just get me like three cocktails. And I said, can you just get me all these so I can drink them after the show? And then like, that's all, that's all there for us. And also they had these shuttles where basically you could go as far as Cologne for free. It's also very rare. You'll ever have alcohol provided at an event. Oh yeah. That that setting. Yeah, of course. Exactly. So they had alcohol provided. They had a shuttle, which could take you one anywhere in Dusseldorf or two. I took it to Cologne by myself and I just walked around for like, like five hours there. It's only like half an hour away Summit, right? Isn't it like 45 minutes? 40, 45 away? minutes away. And then they had the okay. shuttle ready for the time I needed to go back to the studio to That's do the cast cool. later. Like I, I basically get to be a tourist during the day for free, which is insane. Okay. And so they also had like I, mean, I didn't want to tell you that, but actually some of the other talent behind your back, that's what they call you at the events, the tourist, you know, because you're just sort <laughs> of like stepping into their life, you know, and just sure. enjoying the sights and stuff. Whatever. Yeah, sure, whatever. Sure, whatever. Sure. whatever. Don't, don't even mind that moniker. <laughs> that doesn't even need a combat. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, I mean but also they had like uh, gym memberships for everybody at a really really nice gym. They had laser tag for some reason. They had go-karts. You could just book any of this stuff whenever you wanted. Uh, 
I mean, they had uh, electric scooters so you could take it around the city. Just like that's cool. And then also they had skateboards. I don't know if anybody's taken a skateboard. I think Sponge took it and and literally fell and got injured the first. That like, sounds like second. such a recipe for disaster. Fucking yeah. skateboards. Yeah, give, that, give everyone up, needs the wrists. What are we doing at all? Like, what are we doing? <laughs> I don't know, but they have. Why it. are people skating over thirty anyway? So they just like yeah. break all your bones. <laughs> Sponge literally, I think he literally did the uh, the Steve Buscemi uh, little skit because of oh, yeah. the oh right, hey, fellow kids, hey, right, because he because he like he messed up his hand just because he did that. But basically, right. basically, whereas a few other, I'd say tos are either downgrading or just kind of staying stagnant with how they're carrying things out. ESL is upgrading stuff, and it's expected given the new influx of cash. Sure. I mean, it sounds like they're going above and beyond all regards. Fair play. Well, yeah, if, you, yeah. if you don't really understand how much like half the game is food, I think that's a huge one. Like just having options. It's like, okay, you get every, it's kind of just about not messing things up. Like we get into a green room. If everyone's cool in the green room, there's like lots of banter. We're having fun. The broadcast will be better right after the, we For get sure. out of the green room, go onto the desk, go onto the cast. We're all going to be laughing about stuff. It's going to be great. And then the other thing is that if there's no food options or the food is cold or it's, you know, can of eats in, it's like sausage and fries in six different ways, <laughs> then eventually like you are going to lose your mind and yes. it will bleed right into the broadcast right after. And so, yeah, some of these places that have great broadcasts, you don't see it, but half the work is done just making sure the talent have like options oh, to sure. eat, aren't exhausted and are actually having fun. I even think that's an area that, like, like, as you mentioned, like they underrate the fact that, like, people sort of understand for pro players, you know, they should understand the science of their nutrition and, like, balance out what they're doing. I'm sure fans now would understand, you know, like, don't just chug a fucking Red Bull before game one or whatever. But what's mad is they ignore it for talent. It's always the thing people never get because they think, for real, we just come on camera for 10 minutes and it's like, that's all we did that day. It's like, remember, the person might be working for, like, eight hours. So in that time period, like, actually, when you eat, what it is and in what condition it comes in might have a massive effect on, like, uh, not only your energy levels, but if you're even like you're enjoying the event, if you're fucking triggered. Like, I know it sounds like a minor detail, but believe it or not, the, fo the food being cold when you've waited like two hours for it is a massive triggerer. That just makes you feel like, oh, what the fuck? Why? You essentially just start to feel like, am I just trapped at the event because I said yes to the money? Like, it starts to suck, mm. you know? It brings you down because in that scenario, you always think, well, I could just go and get better food than this, but I can't because I'm having to do a job for you. So why are you giving me shit food? Like, surely you want me to do a great job and, and feel happy and, you know, feel like comfortable. And especially the thing like you all said about the fries and stuff. If you have to have fries like three times a day, I don't care how many fries you like. Like, it's going to get fucking boring, mate. And it's going to be dog shit for you. Like I say, for your energy levels, you're going to be spiking all over the place, mate. Yeah, but then the people don't know it. It's infamous as well, right? Henry used to fucking love this because we have this weird thing in England. I don't know if you know this. Part of our banter culture is something that would really piss you off. It's somehow really funny when it happens to your mate. I don't know why it is, but it's true. Like, if something happened to me, obviously I'd be mild in, but if it happens to Richard, I would be laughing like, oh, I can't, I can't believe the fucking reckon you like this, Richard. You even sort of like fucking egg them on, don't you? Like, I can't believe they're doing this to you. You're not going to stand for this, idea. So anyway, Henry used to just be doing that to me all the time because he used to, he just noticed, right, that I, because I, I actually do like fries, but I hate it when they're cold. So every uh, time I would come in and we'd made the order and I've just come in off like a half hour desk session and I'd just see the fries there and he'd already have that fucking shit eating grin on his face like, Try it, Thorin. I think warm enough. He was like loving it. He was like, it's like he was enjoying like my fucking suffering. But yeah, anyway, aside from that, he's a cool guy. He's just a cunt about fries. But yeah, basically, that was ruining half my events. That's all you need to know. <laughs> yeah, let's go Dusseldorf. Exactly. Yeah, I, if every event ends up being there for ESL, just. <laughs> Just sign me up now. Just also, by up. the way, fair play, because if people don't know, I'm usually a massive critic of food in Germany. I actually find the variety pretty bad. Like They're usually pretty bad for having, like, I mean, that's not, be not a lot of flavor, is there, you know? like So I would normally have been very skeptical. Fair play if they actually provided but, legit catering, real food. The food I got walking around Dusseldorf and Cologne was worse than what I got at catering. So that's okay. that says a that's lot. Good. That actually yeah. implies they did a good job, though. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I wasn't point. doing mad research on like these little jaunts that I went on, but I was also just really impressed with. I mean, the barbecue and the catering and everything, like the options. If you didn't like one dish at the catering, you just stopped eating it and you get another one. That's, that's okay. How it yeah. Right. Well, believe it or not, I don't have tons of sort of topics to jump on there, but we're just going to let him have his moment there, Launders, right? So he's I, picked I up ESL. I can't believe you let him get away with this. Oh, no, so. don't worry. <laughs> on past episodes, like at least three times, he's picked up We Play when he was working for him. Okay, then he had well, one. We his great too. We then he had one for Blast when he did the Blast. So listen, I think people understand. This is just, you know, it's part of what you get in the contract when you sign Maui Stick. Like, he will find a way to awkwardly crowbar into a podcast <laughs> how brilliant it is when you hire him. And in doing so, create an association hey, in your brain. Hey, then if you were to hire him again, he might say it again. So 
I'm just you know. saying, there's an event I did this year that I didn't say any positive stuff about. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Enough said then. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> True. True. <laughs> Indeed. It's all right. I think I said enough about that event myself on Twitter. So I think I've got you covered there. Right. Now we will go to my good point. I actually hinted at it earlier. You know, it's obviously pretty tough in the modern day to find like a good angle on the Astralis topic, right? Like even, believe it or not, to me, the, like the numbers Blame F puts up aren't that great because it looks like the team doesn't know how to actually interact with his fucking frags. Like it feels like he just performs on his own and there's four guys fucking up. So the one thing people have noticed by now, it's obviously a massive narrative they push on the broadcast, but it's something you could notice even from the lands last year, right? Everyone remembers the first land with config was obviously the one that Launders referred to working out earlier, the fall finals. And in that whole tournament, actually, Config was fragging out like a motherfucker. It really looked like he had just like wound the clock back and he was just back in like 2017 or whatever. He was just the man. He was just the shit. But everyone knows since then he had a massive slump and his numbers went to shit in the game. Like, look, I will always say a player like Config, you cannot see in the stats. Like, in fact, even the stats will usually show you he's killing a lot of people. He just might die a lot as well. So it'll even the number out, you know, and he might not look that insane. But I'll just say this to you. You don't get like 0.75 kills per round as an entry if you are shit at the game. Think it through, guys. It's just that the plus minus is going to be different. That's why I don't care what James plus minus is. And I do care what configs kills are, but not the plus minus is the role, right? So to me, though, the one thing that is unusual is for a team that's struggling and he himself had his struggles, he has genuinely become one of the best ancient players in the entire world. It isn't a joke. And for me right now, on ancient, he is unbelievable. Like, I actually think it's not even hype. I know people think because of like people like your kinder who overall are better, like you shouldn't say he's the best empty fragger on ancient. I think it's legit, mate. I've watched the games like I don't think that team has any business winning some of these matches and you'll notice even when he does these games where he drops 30 kills and like 110 ADR they win him fucking 16 14 or in like overtime like this guy is literally so ancient is all him then Nuke, like, half the time, at least, he just does all the fucking work on that map as well. That's, like, half of Astralis' map pool guys on one guy's shoulders. Not only that, the guy who's getting criticised, because, as I just said, if the numbers aren't sick, people assume, well, he can't be a star player then. So, to me, I think this is a massive upside. Like, there's plenty of things about Astralis you can criticise. There's plenty of problems with them and potential, and who knows what's going to happen. But this is, to me, just bona fide good. Like, he's just, on this map, at least, he's got something. He's got some magic. And for me, that's a map. If you have a good entry fragger, you can fucking rule that map, mate. Yeah, I agree. I mean, he's a the, you know second best player on the team probably because you know blame him just more consistent even in the off periods. Config's always been so inconsistent. Unfortunately, that's just the the way it is for him. And the funniest part about Ancient is that like when they first played it when they were on Complexity, they said they had never played the map before, and then came on played it and they like destroyed the other team because blame F and Config just like ran down mid, and they just had like a natural affinity for it. And I bet you anything, knowing Config, you know this Thorin. If you asked him why are you so good at Ancient, we go. I don't know. It's just my map. Like, you know, he'd have some answer like that. Like he just feels it for whatever reason. So no putting your finger on it, but they're so lucky to have that. Cause like you said, ancient and nuke are both core for them. Oh, by the way, that's the other thing. You know, a lot of people, because of, like, movies, they want to seem like they have the swagger and, like, pro projecting him. He isn't doing that, though. Like, one thing I do like is when he do, when he he'll have some, like, slick comment, that actually is who his persona is. Like, I'll give you an example. It's a bit like the old school player. Some people know him from CS 1.6, the old Canadian great player, Shagwa, right? The legendary at Orpa, Right? He also is another guy where that isn't just, like, some slick, like, camera persona. Like, one time, because I was friends with him, right? I was talking to him one time about his setup, and Shagwa was famously, like, a mega fast Orpa. But if you ever looked he was like guardian La at launders he was one of those guys who had the mega low sense setup but they've just used it forever and so they're fast mm -hmm. essentially just because they've always used it right so i once said to him like how can your how can your sense be that low though because basically he was one of those people who had to do the entire like enormous like you know like a fucking giant square pad he had to do that for like a, like a 150 degree turn or something and i was like how could it be that good and he was like i'm just that fast bro but like when you say it like that, like with yeah. nobody That's around, exactly. and, and off instantly, it's like you just have that persona nailed. But that isn't even like a fucking canned line. Like fair play, yeah, I agree. That is exactly who Config is. Like the thing about Config is, I, I understand why he's inconsistent, mate, because I don't think he knows why he plays well or plays bad. I think he genuinely he is. This is why he had the most perfect quote to summarize him. You know when he tr tried to join Astralis, and he said straight faced to fucking Zonic. I don't want to do any media, bro. I just like somewhat like I just want to frag out. Like that really is what he thinks about Counter Strike. Yeah. I love it in some ways because it's so ridiculous, isn't it? I, yeah, you actually you wrote like a the article about him a long time ago. I can't remember what the title was. Pretty slick title, but it was just about how like he's just destined to be kind of like always too good, uh, always 
always too good in everyone's eyes, like never good enough, basically in the server, like never reaching his peak consistently. And I mean, it probably has something to do with the fact that he literally has no idea like why he's good in the first place. Like I don't, I, I can't understand that because I can't relate to that as a player at all. Oh, it's weird. Isn't it? I, don't yeah. I, I talked to, I talked to Config after Katowice because we just had the same route home. So we were like at the airport together and the, I, I kind of just, T- touched on the fact that they they had a good ancient and the only line he really had for it was just like yeah but it's our only good map so basically that goes <laughs> right, yeah. well. <laughs> that goes back to the kind of he's just he's just really <laughs> modest like that and actually sure. this this kind of works out because i actually looked at a couple config demos on my own because i was just curious what i could do to just start running over pugs by playing like play like config basically on ancient and it, it's like like config's theory for mid control on the map is basically do something fi- even if it's a 50-50 by 55 seconds in the map in the round like nice. if you if you just push into into donut or really into red room more often than not like top mid he's going to just do it and he doesn't care if he loses the fight or not basically and it's it's almost the the speed he does it with which is it almost catches people off guard because at the same time you've got blame f trying to come into cave you got like there's some pressure from farlig now uh at a ramp or b ramp and basically you don't and also config just walks into a a lot and just takes a raw dry mm. aim duel with somebody and so he has just he basically is what so many people are just too pussy to do which is just take a raw aim duel within a minute of the round and that just opens everything up for for astralis for for glaive to mid round and even if he dies in mid especially then it just gives his team an avenue into the b bomb side so basically he's like the way i described it on broadcast is he's just like the crowbar for that team he's like the skeleton key of ancient he he'll basically open anything uh, any door open for the rest of the team and then they can work off of it so yeah it, it, honestly if anybody just wants to learn how to just run train on people on ancient just watch config demos because he, he literally gets the timings better than anybody right now that, that did actually make me realize that like one of the most impressive games that i've watched on the youtube channel just watching one person play a spot all half was config playing cat on mirage and oh yeah this idea of him taking like you know 150 50 but with so much like so deliberately with so much per- so much conviction that like he'll take his rifle you know peek off cat hold that hard angle to top mid but when he has that feeling of those timings he will hit that shot he will have it perfect cross air placement and he knows exactly when to pull off of it and maybe because he just leans so hard in his, into his intuitions that like when he doesn't have that feeling that's when he's like oh i just wasn't feeling it like i don't have that game but when he does he can make like five right decisions in that round make it a 4k and get that like 24 and five score lines just like perfect cs for like an entire map um but he will take like a risk that you would maybe only have an opera take in, a, in that same situation one of the weird things to me is like the for some reason people were like mega aimers they sometimes actually like i think like underestimate their skill set. Like they sometimes don't think that because they essentially they take for granted that like everyone must have some aim or something. I don't think they realize how good they are at it. Because to me, two players, Config and Twists are two obvious ones that stand out now, like bonkers mechanical aim, like raw tracking, precision flicks. And like if you ever watch them play, the reason you know these guys are gods of aiming is because there is no shot they ever hit in a sequence that ever actually seems to make them react in any way whatsoever. And I don't want any fans going, no pros like they aren't. There's loads of pros that when they hit a bonkers shot, you can even see them sort of being like, fucker. Like, some of them, you can even see they don't even expect to get the kill. They're sort of, like, overspraying still. Mm-hmm. Like, these guys, for real, they really do that shit where it's like, right. Like, so this is why I'm actually mad impressed with Twists and people don't even bring him up that much. The amount of 1v3s I've seen him win during this land period, the last five Dude. months, where he's just in one where it's like, you're not even supposed to be able to get the second kill. Like, the, the first two guys double peek you, and he just, like, one bullet's each in the head. But then, because, like I say, in his brain, he's like, yeah, but that's what I meant to do. Yeah, oh, no, I better just turn and then kill the third. It's like, everyone else would be going, like, holy fuck, what? Ooh, I never thought, like, you know, like, he didn't at least react. Like, these guys are just fucking mm-hmm. robots, aren't yeah twi- twist is a player that shroud wanted to be you know i think there was this uh yeah, one one, <laughs> one conversation that's I a good analogy yeah one conversation i mean you put them in deathmatch the same player like they ch- kill everything unkillable basically uh i i had this conversation a long time ago with valdo when he was super new and he was just saying that he was playing on cobble on b versus uh shroud on the other side of the smoke and he said when shroud was on ct side on the other side of the smoke he was putting no pressure in no spams no pushes or anything like that valdo said it was no problem and then they swapped shroud out with stewie and stewie was like throwing nades spamming smokes pushing right. the smokes and Valda was saying, man, if I had the aim of Shroud, I would have been pushing that smoke every single round. And yes. yet he didn't do it. So you never realize that potential at all. He just didn't believe in himself in terms of his mechanical ability. When the guy who's on the other side of the screen is terrified of you, he doesn't even know. Yeah. The famous, famous twist code on, 
his twist quote on Cobble, I think it was like post game, maybe like 2017. Is that um, I don't know. I don't know why this became a meme for like for, for a few people in the NA space. But basically, he said uh, he was playing drop, and they're like, "Why are you playing drop when your aim is so good?" And he's like, "I I like playing drop. I like a challenge." And yeah, yeah. He's just carry. He's just carry. He loves playing the hard spots. Yeah. Yeah, he likes <laughs> the hard spots. Yeah. It's a bone. It's he's got like a bone to pick with. Like I think honestly, it probably has something to do with like oh, okay, this is total conjecture. I mean, this is not yeah, the, of course, whatever his personality or whatever. But he had like this whole thing with bullying or something when he was younger. And okay. so this, you know, this can be a huge thing about proving himself, you know, where he's, <clears throat> yeah, and he's got really f- nuts at playing hard spots. And that's, who, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who would, who would you want? Someone who plays squeaky on cash, someone who plays drop on cobble, like every spot that nobody wants. And you, and you got a guy who's willing to stand in all the grenades, like take fights by himself. Like that's beautiful. And so that's how Twist kind of made his brand, basically playing all the hard spots with the best aim. Sure. And by the way, these guys at least have periods where they're mega. I actually think low key, I've got to mention on this topic, the player I always thought was the most ridiculous example of someone who didn't understand his own skill set was fucking Flamey from Navi. Dude, this guy for real, he's another player, mate, where if you just give me his skills, I will play completely differently. I would probably be an entry player. Like, I thought he could do so much. When you watched him play, though, he has to be one of the most scared, like, good aimers I've ever so seen. Vanilla. It was so mad, vanilla, wasn't it? Yeah. And he would just play boring, like you say, just play, like, st- simple counter strike, like, fucking hell. He could have done. That's why I always understood why they kept him on the team. I've no doubt, like in random scrims, he was probably incredible. He probably just took over the whole game. But everyone knows he was just like the most eternally fucking underwhelming player in the actual server. Unfortunately, right. We'll now move. That was all the good section. Even though I managed to find a way to flame flame out of <laughs> nowhere. He got got catching strays, but whatever. At least he's getting mentioned nowadays. Now we'll move on to the bad section. So, Launders, what to you is bad right now? Yeah. Okay. So for bad, uh, this is, I guess, also lines up really well with pro leagues. Um, I've have heroic as the bad. Um, and I was I was listening to a previous episode where uh, Snappy was on, and he was talking about how the thing about heroic is like everyone says they have no star player, but that star player is Stown. But I think the other side to that same conversation is the fact that Stown is their only star player right now, yes. and that if we look at every single other player on the team, they fall off a cliff when it comes to land. We've had this conversation for almost a full year now. Yes, they are able to have decently good land results in the same way that Gambit have a top eight or a top four placing, but no big tournaments. So when Glaive throws shade at him and says, come back when you real, win a real event, that is an actual mental hurdle that they have yeah, to deal yeah. with right now to prove that they are of the quality to be in the top five where they are right now. So right now, Heroic can beat anybody in a group stage and they can beat anyone online, but they can't win a tournament. That's the fact. And uh, the truth is, if you look at the stats, Stown is the only player that doesn't fall off at all on land. You go to his land stats for the last 12 months, it's identical to his online stats, which means he's playing even better on land. And then you look at Katie and he drops off five points. You look at Tessus and Refresh, they drop off almost 13 points. It's actually absurd. Like he has no help whatsoever. And so now if Stown even plays badly, they have no chance whatsoever, but he can't be expected to be that consistent, you know, to save the rest of his team when overall it's clearly not a problem of the quality of the team. They're clearly a good team. They have their own unique style, super fun to watch. Kadian plays a high-risk style and is good enough to actually almost get top 20 stats in the last year, plus he's opping, IGLing, and everything like that. Everyone knows how good Tessus is, and beyond that, there are great moments. And that's why everyone says, oh, they don't have one star player. The truth is, they're just all wildly inconsistent. And that's why you can say some of them are good and some of them are bad. So right now, Heroic have a huge problem. It almost reminds me of 2017 when Astralis win their first major with Glade, but they're still not the best team in the world. They broke through at that moment, and that's when you realize it was all mental, and it had nothing to do with how good they were in the first place. But you can't just discount how important that mental barrier is. And there's actually no telling that just because Astralis did it with Glaive in 2017, that Heroic will ever do it. Come on, Mouse Nick. Here's the thing. Mouse yeah. Nick technically had his point in argument that was a bit like this. So we'll find a way to sort yeah, it's, through this, right? It's sim- it's similar. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, I'll like touch more on the angle that like everybody else but Stown falls off. I think that right now with Heroic, it's kind of like, it, it's almost like their macro perspective on the game is too good and that everybody has a chance to shine so consistently. Whereas some teams, they definitely put more resources in one player over another. And so if I'm Heroic... I almost think feel like you got to make somebody a consistent point man or a guy that should be succeeding other than Stown because you need to build up a second star on the team. You need to like like Shush is one of the best support players and he barely needs any resources and he's always going to thrive or like do his job. I'd say I'd even say thrive in like lower pressure environments. 
refresh and then so basically you have to pick between refresh and test this do you want one of these guys to be your second star of the team and right now i'd, I'd probably slightly lean towards refresh personally actually um just just a little bit more experience i feel like he makes more correct decisions testis has more sick mechanical little instances but that's not that's not necessarily a guy you want to set up for like late rounds necessarily it's a guy you want to like just be a, a first or second in more more so so if they change up their style just enough where it's not as balanced for the other riflers and and make it more about getting refresh into a really ideal two on two two v three situation that might that might do them some good and and they just have to give confidence to it because it does feel like it's a little bit it, it's just spread almost <clears throat> too evenly uh and that, that's such a weird thing to say because you generally want a team that's going to be designed like heroic that's that's always that like everybody has a chance to thrive but i think you just need to make someone more of a focal point i just dis i actually disagree with that between the the you know the dichotomy between refresh and tests like i haven't haven't seen either of these players play well long enough for either mm. of them to be like reliable in that sense whereas like kadian actually has and i think was the only next potential best test has slightly behind when it comes to talking about who was the best players of the year and like stouts cleared number one kadian lagged behind and kadian's style is even riskier has the off as well so maybe should be getting more stats more of an art more of a, a Kerrigan, something like that, upfront leader, whatever. But uh, between those two, like <coughs> if you have to lean on them, I mean, could you really lean on either Tessus or Refresh right now to be like even a, a third star? If we look at FaZe Clan, for example, as an example of a team that will win a tournament that have a really solid core, do they stand up to any of the players, Rops, Twists, or Brokey? I don't think so. I, well, okay. If you when you say Rob Swiss and Brokey, that that trio is just better than any trio you can put together on Heroic. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, yeah. When if you put Stown against a couple of those guys, it's really tough to even put him like toe to toe with them. And it's almost like this. Okay, I, I, I put I put this out there. Do you think the structure of Heroic is actually lifting them to just be so much greater than the sum of their parts that none of these guys on their own can become a star player? on heroic yeah on heroic on heroic then uh they i i you know i can't i honestly can't put my finger on it i think it <coughs> has to, so much to do with the land pressure as opposed to the mm, quality okay. of player they are like that's the again for me like it's the drop off it's not yes. the peak it's the drop off so i'll take this thing because that's actually yeah, what i was going to jump in so basically i agree the problem i have is this people will know i made a video last year where i said actually i like there was so much upside to this team so much potential like obviously yes they have some sort of issue in just big games in general it feels like like the joke against in this team liquid matches like that's not even deep in the tournament but because of the bracket that is the big game like essentially that is the game you know that if you win the bracket becomes a lot easier and maybe you're in the final so to me that's when they know it's the big game. it's what the big game for them is not what the big game for the opponent is that's why by the way to me it's so mental they lost to Astralis at that fucking blast finals yes obviously the crowd shit but put that out of the way they should have won anyway yeah. because Astralis is a way worse team it's a brand new lineup if you actually believe you're the better team you just win that match but in that match I could tell for them that was the big match of the tournament that's why Kadian put all the fucking emphasis on it that's why he doubled down essentially he just wanted it to be that one match that really did determine for the next few years who could talk shit and he put all his chips in the middle and obviously he lost and it was it's kind of blown up his face but whatever to me that that's a symptom of like the fact that they do know this is a problem. And like every one of the teams that gets in this spot, eventually you try different things. You know, Liquid tried things. Astralis years ago tried things. You try a few different angles. It's just that it's obviously a very hard nut to crack. I mean, by the way, it's also the most rewarding one. If you crack it, you see what Team Liquid, what Astralis could do when they did become number one. It's why these rosters are worth sticking with and not just tossing away. But that's where I get to my issue, Launders, is when I look at this team and especially the land performances, it's just become a pattern now. Like, it is actually routine for them to underperform. Because if you think about it, right, I'll give you a quick breakdown. At the major, they could have been in the final. That one, I don't blame them for too much. It wasn't equal going mental. But even so, they had many chances to win the game. They were almost there. But you think to yourself, ah, Nico, go and create nothing you can do about that. But then you go to the other tournament, that Blast 4 finals. That's a joke where they finished in that, mate. That was wide open for that to be a finals, a top three finish. Then you go to the IM winner. There was no Navi. They didn't even make the playoffs. 
holy shit, your nip had like a stand in and made the final. Like, dude, that's supposed to be like a win where people don't even count it because they go, oh, there's no Navi, so you wouldn't have been there. You didn't even win the tournament. Then you go to the other blast one, they didn't win the final of that either. If people haven't noticed, they haven't made a final on land. They haven't yeah. done it, guys. So the problem I have is this. I'm with you, Lon, is I think it's all to do with like land experience, pressure, especially stage matches seem to fuck them up, like you saw in kind of eats here. By the way, if there wasn't if that wasn't a bracket custom made to make you go to the final, one team is a horrible real life situation affecting them mentally the other team that you could face has to use fucking stand-ins for the match in f- they were even swapping out for positions that don't make sense like if you are going to win these games like, it has to be on you at some point these aren't, these aren't teams that are just beating you so for me that factor is what's killing their team because I'm kind of like the mouse snake angle on I do think that individually essentially the team being so good maybe made us overrate some of them individually like I did think they were like more than the, some of their parts as a team like I thought they had a pretty cool little identity as a squad mm-hmm. but I've also noticed aside from Stown realistically not only are the others up and down but you just look at it like you can't even know this is the worst thing they're not even a team that has a map pool where it's like right well this is their best map so they'll be good there dude they can lose their map pick to anyone they can lose their best map to anyone but they can also beat anyone and win anyone's map pick now that is actually terrible if you want to be the best team in the world like the best team in the world has like a logic to how they win what maps they win on who they play so I feel like if I'm heroic like this is such a mental thing I don't even know how you fix this because the other thing I find mad underwhelming is if I just go the other way and build up their positives right their map pool no joke they should be top four at every event they play at. They have a fucking unreal map pool. And as I always go to pains to point out, they even rotate the fucking veto. I don't think people know how OP that is if you can do it. If you can do that, that what I just said about Fury applies to Heroic. You can always have a series that at a minimum is an even series or you are favoured in the series if you so want it. That's on the table at all times. They haven't made use of it. Then you look at them in the fucking games. They only have two modes. Everyone who's watched Heroic knows this. They either shit stomp you 16-7 and you have no chance and you go, wow, this is the Heroic we all want to see. Or they just lose every fucking game 16-13. And you're like, oh, that was, oh. And so unfortunately, the one player I have to criticise, I know why you bigged him up because look what he was online. He, and he, KD and is basically the reason this team exists and the reason they play this way. My problem is this though. He has the double role. Like, I think as an IGL, generally, he does a good job. I'm not sure he has the raw firepower to be, like, amazing all the time. But, yes, he, he does a general good job. The problem is, if he's going to be the IGL and the AWPA, I think you're already asking too much of one person in World Counter-Strike. Like, who the fuck else is an IGL and AWPA and trying to win every tournament? That doesn't even exist. That Basically, that hasn't existed since Fallen. Oh. And in his team, they famously say, Cold Zero made 40% of the calls. So, like, you know what I mean? Like, to me, you're trying to sort of ice skate uphill with the KD angle. So, my problem is... I, I just feel like they're a bit in a they're kind of trapped because first of all the lineup probably is like chemistry and things like that is why they're good and also they all seem to get along with each other there's all that angle but then the other thing for me is it's hard to remove Cadian because essentially then we have to know for sure the guy coming in is a better IGL like I think yeah. he's doing if I had to pick out the two roles I think he's a better IGL actually than Orpa so the problem is unless you can basically sign device I don't really know what angle you've got to sort of get out of trouble in this case you know I think they're a bit stuck mate yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, there is a question of like, could Stown primary off? Because clearly, they're just the best hybrid. He might be one of the best hybrids just in the world right now, like, period. So he, like, he could potentially do that, but then you you lose half a rifler, which is also yeah, true. a yes. drawback for your team. Um, but yeah, I agree. I guess that that's always potentially possible. I was just thinking maybe you know because of the style they play, if we compare them directly to Astralis back then when they broke that mental barrier, Astralis were way more reasonable in every single thing they did, whereas Heroic yes. are way more fiery, right? They do these mi- weird mid-round double pushes. Their protocols must be so much harder to follow all the time, and there's yes. so many situations where they know if they die on a push, they lose the round. And so maybe the pressure just mounts so much more heavily. It just amplifies when they get into a situation where there's a crowd in front of them in their already really, really you know dangerous to play location. So maybe the style of play is something that is kind of holding them back. But at the same time, like you're saying, with Kadian, gives them their identity in the first place. So they might have to come to terms oh, with mate, that. I'm with you on that. That's another problem is every game where they have the 16-7 stomp, like I'm talking about, that's all like amazing calls, great mid-rounds, always tacking the right. So the problem is, yeah, it's like you have to take the good with the bad because I agree. Part of my problem is this. I suspect because they try to get so slick with fucking like retakes on the site and then swapping over, the, like because they they seem to always try to throw a curveball in there, like Carrigan style. The problem is, Cadian himself's like fairly inexperienced at being an IGL in big stage matches. Like, mm-hmm. so if anyone has like a slight drop off 
This is why Astralis were the goats. It's so hard to make a tactical style of play like that work consistently. Because mm. the idea in this scenario is you're both using like reads on the opponent and like it, stuff on the fly, but then you're also trying to use set pieces. Like that's fucking hard to make work. So if even one or two players get nervous, you're going to already have a bit of a drop off. And I get the vibe. This is the other problem I have with their team, I have to say. The one last area, I don't think Cadian does a good job. And fans are going to think I'm wrong here because they're going to look at Cameron and go, you're wrong. I don't think Cadian's doing a great job as a captain, mate. They're going to think he does because he's always like, you know, giving the speech and uh, everything for camera looks great. My problem is this. He doesn't seem like, and by the way, I've always said this was a thing I always thought Carrigan had a problem with as well. He doesn't seem like he's that great at sort of like the timeout that picks the team up or like, wow, we've got to make some swap up here or like I've got to motivate my star player. It feels like he's just, he just has to take whatever he gets in the server. I don't feel like he has much emotional control over the team. That's my vibe at least. He's also playing games publicly that maybe the rest of his team isn't comfortable with. I have no idea. I don't, are... I, I don't think some of them would like to trash talk and get fans against them. You it's get like that vibe as well, you know. Like when Cadian and, and Glaive went at it, I was like, hell yeah, like a little drama. Let's go talk shit about yes. each other. And then Glaive went on the broadcast, on the Pro League broadcast, and he was just like, oh, it was a nice move by Cadian. Oh, Cadian, that's a really good Cadian call right there. Like totally trying to squash the beef before <laughs> okay. it even starts. I was like, fuck off, man. Like this was just getting good. And then sure. you realize Cadian is really willing. I mean, he started, he's really willing to be in this zone oh, for sure but that's not very danish at all they, so you know they they yelled at each other at breakfast at the hotel <laughs> oh really let's go yeah 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 i don't know what they said in danish or yeah i don't know what they said but they they were yelling at each other then so yeah might they, just be bad man could, could be, be. Could be. yeah i was I, I i was past this information from uh from heku <laughs> So, so she, so she sure. was the one that heard it all because I didn't, I didn't get breakfast that day. But I will say, like, just to wrap up my point, here's how I would phrase it: I don't know if I've ever seen a team that was like a, on paper in all regards a legit top five contender, like should be an amazing team. I don't think I've ever seen one that consistently underwhelmed me this much on LAN. Like I say, whenever, whenever you see a bracket. You know when you do that thing where you, you like every analyst does this, you look for what the great matchups can be down the line. They always fucking ruin the bracket for you. They always do. And by the way, God forbid they win the upset match early on, then they'll just fuck up the bracket in the semis. And then some yeah. shitty team will be in the final, won't they? Like fucking cl like the old classic where Renegades introduced the world to fucking Vanguard by giving the most free final in the history of majors. Now look, it all worked out years later, but at the time that was whack as fuck, wasn't it? I remember just turning to Chad like, the fuck are they doing here, mate? It's your old team. They're still garbage, but whatever. That was kind of like, what happened with uh, Heroic in the major playoff bracket, where they were... They, yeah, they had an G2 amazing right bracket, there. dude. It would have stopped G2 right there, and we would yeah. have just had G2 our shit, and they came into the major looking like shit, and then they played like shit, and then they yes. lost. And instead, they just beat Heroic because they beat the pressure. Yeah, the joke is all they did accomplish at the major was making it really cruel when they fucking kicked yeah, Abenek okay. next to the fuck out. Because, like, for real, it was like, you're in the major, but I don't care, just get the fuck out. Like, what? Yeah. The fuck? What? So one of the teams we discuss on this episode of Snake and Banter is, of course, the infamous evil geniuses with Stewie 2 and Cirque and Breeze, Automatic. You know the squad. They were supposed to maybe on paper be an NA super team. Problem is, they haven't been that good recently. Well, guess what? I've got a bet for you that involves evil geniuses. Because if we have a look here at the RMR, the American RMR for the PGL Major coming up in Antwerp, they are a team who, on paper, are one of the favourites to get through. But they have been playing so woefully. They have been losing so many maps to all kinds of levels of opponent, European or otherwise. And they get smashed on these maps. And then fragging-wise, they have been so bad in the server, the eye test doesn't check out for almost any of the players. And quite frankly, the structure and the calling style looks whack. So I think this team is, even though it's only just started, it feels almost done right out the gate to me so there's actually a match up here where eg plays against pain gaming now obviously pain gaming used to be hard carried by safe who they don't have now he obviously plays for furia but i actually think if you look the odds aren't that crazy for pain it's basically just over two it's 1.689 for eg i actually think in this matchup i'm saying screw it i actually think pain gaming is going to upset them and get the win and i'm gonna put a thousand of the djt tokens on it and we'll check back maybe if they do it on a future episode i'll tell you if eg was indeed that whack right corner on mouse nick what is your bad and by the way when we get to the ugly one you'll have to figure out if you want to rejig yours for that one that you I've, had earlier i've so got think... still a little bit more stuff to give on all right like go yeah, for the bad then what was bit. your bad point my bad point is that EG are just so far behind every other team right now. They were just br brutally difficult to watch at Pro League. Uh, they went 0-5. They won a single map. And I'll just tell you guys, they played 11 maps at Pro League. They only 
were able to achieve 13 or more rounds once, and it was against, against complexity. Yeah. Yeah, and it was the map, the one map they won. The one map they won, they got 13, 13 or more rounds. But And so, yeah, I think that right now, EG, you look at what they're doing, and there's just it, this is just a project that, in a way, I'm, I can't really go as far to say that I think they're not going to make it through the America's RMR, but they are by no means competitive on the world stage right now. And I think it's, re- it's just super difficult to watch because when we saw them at Blast, at the beginning of the year, we I, I kind of felt like, oh, okay, well, Automatic Rush and Stewie actually looked like they were the best three at that event. But then this event comes around, and it's actually Breeze and Cirque who are the best two. So there's not even consistency in who's finding success on the roster. The T-sides are just abhorrent. They're, like, really, really just... Stewie is just like running into his death every single round and it's not even it's not even fun to watch. It's not even like, oh, what was the idea there? It was like, oh, he just really wanted to die in the first 20 seconds of this round. That was cool. Um so I I really wanted this EG to roster to work. I mean, it's I, th- I don't think it really go- it goes without saying that I think a lot of people from North America wanted this roster to work given the, you know, tenured players that are on it, the fact that you have three guys that want to major together, but they are just they're miles, miles, miles behind even what complexity you're doing. Uh, and it's it's not even a competition for who's the second best NA team. It, it's obviously complexity. Uh, it's it, EG are they, I like EG legitimately at this RMR might get upset by a team that has no business upsetting them because they they really are that bad. They can't they like can't even hold the default against a European team and expect to not die. That's basically how it looked at Pro League. But when a new roster is formed, I think a lot of analysts and stuff like that look at this the, from the perspective of who is the core, who the three players taking up the most space and have the most onus to do the most. And those two two riflers in the opera. And nobody knew who the third player was going to be with EG. The first two are supposed to be Breeze and Zerk. And yeah. their inconsistency is like unreal. And a huge problem for them is the region. <clears throat> but I'll probably talk about that a little bit later. But when we saw Automatic play well at the beginning. We're like, OK, this is starting to make sense. But then it got to the point where it was Rush and Stewie who were the ones who were helping the most. And someone came into my chat and they're like, do you think Rush can be top 20 this year? And I was like, do you not see the issue with that? Like if oh. Rush is a top 20 player this year, this team has failed completely. Like it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And then you have someone who was top 20 in Breeze who cannot hold his own anymore at all. Like can't even play his regular spots like long on dust two, just not hitting shots as an anchor, pure aim duels. He's just not there right now. And it makes no sense. But the thing is that it's easy to point out the problems. Who the fuck do you replace Breeze with? You know, like if you're, it's like cutting twist from liquid. You want to wait as long as possible before you do that because you're either going to give him to a team where he's going to play better or you're going to be in a problem where you can't find a guy who was ever as good as Breeze was in NA. You know, you could go international if you'd like to, but there's just not many options. So this team has just so many problems. I agree. Yeah, the problem, like, if people don't know, I'll just give you a stat right now. Since I'm not the biggest fan of the HLTV rating, but I know everyone else, it's like the fucking Bible. It's what they use to guide themselves. All you need to know is in 2022, nobody on the team has even a 1.0 rating. Nobody. Nobody. That means whoever gets the most resources and all their spot, no, not even them. So that means essentially, like, look, obviously stats aren't the be all end all, but I would challenge you to ever find a relevant team that ever had a number like that. Like, that is almost impossible for a good team. Like, at least one player would be having like okay stats. Like, and as you're saying, the eye test doesn't match up either. It's actually maybe even worse than you'd imagine. It's appalling how bad these guys frag in game. Because the problem is, I can totally see why they've made this team. First of all, I know a couple of like the people who sort of fucked with each other and liked each other's friends anyway. But also, you look at the lineup, look at if we go back in a time machine, this is 2019. This is a fucking banging lineup. It's like an NA super team. The problem is, it ain't 2019 for any of these players. Like, the joke is, as you're saying, Rush might be the only serviceable player right now in the sense that he's actually stuck around the game. He's been through all different roles, and I get the feeling he's just willing to do whatever you need to to fill the gaps, as it were. Automatic's only decent in the sense that he just came back from a different game, so we're sort of giving him a pass. The others, I don't think, get any pass at all. Like, I do think this project will be, essentially, the end of Stewie 2. UK being an IGL like this is the hubris of this project is like mate if you can be an IGL in it for this type of team at least you've got to have maybe like different types of players because to me there's just no fragging so I don't know how his style's going to work and then the two players who were the original EG players Breeze and Cirque like 
are these guys just shameless? How many fucking enormous checks are you going to take from that org and then not put out actually an even serviceable world-class performance? I'm not even saying be a top 10 player in the world, but you guys aren't even sniffing the top 20. This is pathetic, mm -hmm. especially because like Cirque, I could maybe even see a world where if the team falls to part, like it can be a lot of stress to be an Orpa. I don't even understand what happened to Breeze though, mate, because that guy, if we go back in that time machine of 2019, his game was nailed the fuck down. Yeah. And he looked like if we hadn't have gone online the next year, he was going to make a run for like fucking, like he could have been like the fifth best player in the world or something. He really was like a, a really, really good, like he was a player that looked like he was about to go to like, to me, he was just a year from being like an Elyse type player where he just, every game, you know, consistent performance, other team has to deal with him, ADR great, you can't stop the guy, gets it, you know, he, the, the, the regression from these players has been uh, so disappointing to me. Breeze, Breeze was my favorite player in 18, 19, uh, yeah. pretty much beyond, I mean, everybody knows I like Henny, but Breeze was probably my second favorite player. Uh, just like the lack of resources he got and the success he found was undeniable. It was so, it was such a pleasure to watch. And yeah, I don't know right now what, what's, what's going on with, with him mentally or what, because with, with, with how he was see, succeeding before, it felt like it was all self-driven. Like it didn't have to be a structure around him that, that worked like, man, like, uh, you're talking about anchor spots earlier, Lonners. Like the way that he would anchor A on Nuke, it's like he was always good for two, almost three kills. Didn't matter how crazy the exec got. Didn't matter how many people were in perfect trading position. Like he was so, his time to kill was so fast and he was so good at playing that back silo position. But now it's like, if he gets one, I feel like EG just, that's expected. That's ex that's expected mm -hmm. one or none, and it's like what like how did he go from being one of the best backside players in the world to like Kyojin levels of performance there? It's just it's just baffling to me. And I know Stewie is is definitely an insane mid rounder. Everyone knows that at this point. Uh, even uh, basically in terms of player reviews of him, I played with him personally. He is like a natural leader and really really good at mid rounds. And he basically knows at 45 seconds, which is the better site to go to. That's Dewey's game. He will call it confidently. People will follow him. They'll win. And he'll also do the entry work. So there's a lot to believe in there. When it comes to the concept, like conceptualizing the entire round, entire matches, entire tournaments, that's not the guy he's known to be. And like there was right. clashes with him and other IGLs in the past, you know, him and following as well and agreeing on play styles. But to add another layer to that problem, they take on Cirque and Breeze, who played with an incredible amount of structure with Stanislaw, and were missing mostly a Stewie-type player in the mid-round to add to their game. They were having such a good time at having hot starts in matches, and then they'd end up losing because they weren't malleable enough to adapt. And Breeze and Cirque are used to playing <coughs> under that structure. So many set plays for Cirque under both Daps and Stanislaw at different points in time. Um, and Breeze just, I guess, understanding that the rest of the round is organized, he's free to like play the anchor spots like you're saying to his liking. But right now, it's just Stewie bringing in this Team Liquid energy, which is incredibly chaotic and aggressive. And saying that players like Breeze and Cirque, as he said, I think in an interview, are hard to change now that they've learned how to play a certain way and gotten to this point in their career. So that already feels terminal. And if anyone never saw Prime Breeze, his spray was nasty as fuck. He had yeah. really good spray, which, I, which, by the way, I actually think is a pretty underrated quality in CSGO because you know it's as a game as opposed to 1.6. You, you have like the rare players who were just exceptional at it and then the rest of everyone just feels like average. Like everyone's like a 7 out of 10 on sprays. So to me, any anytime I see a player who's really good at that, it always stands out to me. So I thought yeah. uh, Bobby Wye was a mega anchor player. I, I don't... Uh, this is such a weird... This is like a really weird off, off take, but it actually feels like it might matter now for Breeze, especially with his mechanical ability dropping off, is that I looked at his I looked at, so on ESEA, every single month in North America, Breeze was literally top four leaderboard RWS every time. Like, basically okay. just grinding, stealing knives from ESEA every single month. And and he had like 2,000 career pugs on ESEA. And I just looked, like, he hasn't played a pug on ESEA in a long-ass time, for one. And two, it's like he plays face it, but like so sparingly, I feel like he just, I honestly just feel like this dude needs to pug again or something like, cause clearly what he's doing, like if he's just showing up for DM scrims or practice, basically, I don't think that's enough because I think his, the style that he likes to play is it's supported by the fact that he needs to have some of the nastiest mechanical ability out there. It, it's such a, it's such a stretch, but like I need this dude to just grind pugs again, like honest to God. 
Here's the problem. Since you say, like, obviously you can look up if you've played CSGO, all I'm going to say is this. If someone out there looks up and you find out this guy's been putting in any decent amount of hours in Valorant, just get the fuck out of CSGO right now. Because that's one thing I'm so worried about, mate. It's like, I know people are going to think it's just because of the Ethan angle. Breeze is the next one where I'm just waiting for the fucking, the, that news post to come out. Like, he is retired from CSGO, but he is transitioning straight to this team of Valorant. Like, it just feels like it's the next move, which I don't, I don't even want to have to think about that. Because unfortunately, like, here's the thing. I'm I'm fine with people obviously playing games in their spare time. But when someone sucks as much as this, I almost want it to be that you're just not trying. You know, I don't want it to be that you're actually putting in the hours and you're just bad at the game now. That sucks. Yeah, it can't be. I can't even believe that he would have peaked. And again, when people bring up, like, it's like reasonable people can say you need to cut Breeze. And that actually makes sense based on what we're seeing. But there's just no better solution. No, I get you. To to get rid of him. That's the really tough part. But hey, who Dude, I, I think they're even in a worse spot because here's the other problem I think they have. Let's say you cut both the players. So you just said, right, I've got to make the hard cuts. Breeze and Cirque, you aren't making it, mate. You've both been pretty whack and EG. Right, even if you recruited like the best complexity players, you pick which two you want, right? The problem then is they haven't got the LAN experience. They can't, they're not like factory made for the team. So yeah, I'm with you. You don't, The problem is, I mean, they were obviously trying to get NAF. Unless you could get other team liquid players, mm-hmm. I don't really know who you get. Like they're just, at the moment, they're just, as mad as this sounds, I know everyone's playing bad, but they're sort of gambling that at least two of them sort of get good in, it has to happen eventually sort of logic, right? Yeah, I'm actually going to, that's kind of my next point oh, to talk about kind of the other teams um, as well. So I'm not, it's all right, we'll get to it. We'll get yeah. to it. Because here's the good news. This is familiar trend here. So I will say, if too much of this goes into your point, we can tweak that other one. We can find a way around it. Because yeah, yeah. I had one that, and now I look at it, might be similar to yours. Basically, I'll make it very strict and we can see how much you want to go into it. Sure. I'll specifically say Team Liquid's level, what I've seen of the level of this lineup there's a reason I put it in the bad category. It isn't good enough. Like, I actually think they've managed one of the maddest roster moves I've ever seen. Because you know that classic saying in politics, my mistake, where it's like, you know, you can't be neutral on a moving train because the premise is the train moves. So obviously, even if you stand still, you're moving backwards, aren't you? Because you don't move forward. Like, that's what they need to learn. Because what they've done, dude, is do slight upgrades when everyone else in the world's making massive upgrades and they've ended up in the same bloody position they were in in 2021. So what they do is this. You look on paper and you go, that shouldn't be a half bad lineup. Some decent firepower there. And if you could get this foreign non-American player to work with them, this could be interesting. Then you go into a game and they have a game where, you know what? They beat a top team. They get like a top six or seven team in the world and they beat him in a close best of three. And you go, you know what? Maybe Liquid's here to, all right, they've lost their next match immediately. They've ruined their own bracket and someone else's bracket. Great. So like, mate, I'm just bombed out by this team because I watch it and it's like all the things I want to be good I hope Alicia's still good I hope Naf's still good that was always fucking the case so the mad thing is I don't feel like anything's changed and the new, and the problems they've got now look it's a slightly different problem with Shocks than it was with Fallen but I don't it doesn't feel like they're going to make progress so as much as I don't want to bail on a team this early on they haven't had the light that long I'm just getting a horrible vibe from the way the games play out the way they perform even the fact that they say so many positive things like I'd almost want like at least something negative to come out of the interviews when I'm watching because at the moment guys this fucking has not hit the ground running like if this was going to work the way you envisioned on paper oh yeah so okay two incredibly tone deaf roster moves with team liquid right i think like you're getting getting nitro back like there's some irony to the interview that he's saying there's a lot more gatekeepers in na when you know basically he wouldn't get this <laughs> yeah, he's gatekeeping a spot right now from some unfortunately fucking yeah. yeah i mean obviously he would still take it <laughs> that's good i love that him back but i love that you know, yeah that's the, the sad part is like yeah he, <laughs> if he were to grind up again he wouldn't get a spot on team liquid right he'd get it because like it's literally this guy's it, shameless like, mate what next like i tell you what people just fuck off to other games they can stay gone as far as i'm concerned anyway what are we doing here like what are you talking about mate? Well, of course if you're gonna get the if you're gonna get the position you're gonna take it right i mean at least he's yeah he's i get it on the sure. problem. so that's that's one thing and then shocks i mean what the fuck like like okay he's uh, honestly the the really tragic part about shocks was that he was actually good on vitality really good especially towards the end of the year bringing in the land win coming into the lurking role it's the most role defined shocks i've ever seen since like you know way before G when he was calling for g2 was the ugliest point in the career and then i think at the end of Vitality, they actually won their event and he was like actually lurking properly every round. I I don't know. That was perfect. And then he goes to an English speaking roster, which I feel like can't help at all. Uh, he said he in an interview did like right after he joined Team Liquid that I was like, how is it, you know, just speaking English with everyone in uh, Utrecht or whatever their facilities like 
people have been speaking English for three days and is really tired. <laughs> and I'm just like, yeah, he's thinking in French. He mu it must be so exhausting to deal with this cultural differences. All that stuff matters so much. Plus the fact that he was barely really good as a French player on a French team on a team he'd played to get on for so long. So all that didn't really make sense and they needed to upgrade, not side grade. So, uh, yeah, tone deaf roster moves the core, the, the saddest part about liquid great core that continuously works. They just need to raise that uh, floor a little bit, but with the roster moves they made, they kind of put a situation where they, they can't do that easily. And I, I will say though, also one thing nitro had a really fantastic series the other day, um, in their quarter, Nitro and OC were two of the best players on the team, and Nitro looked like the full-fledged 2019 Liquid player that he was before, on land and everything, so that's nice. And it is still early for him to get back, but we also have to remember that during the end of Team Liquid, you know, Nitro got cut, but it wasn't totally unexpected. He wasn't playing that well in the past last few months before he got cut. You mean the, the game they played against Heroic? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that one, that one. Nitro. Everybody, everybody delivered in that one. That was a mm -hmm. that was a pretty pretty great team victory for them overall. I would say that the way I characterize this this whole roster move when it happened is, I think, proving to be pretty true. Where I said that Liquid ceiling is essentially OC ceiling because we knew what we were going to get from Elise and Naf in that the, I mean, yeah, they're performing well. They performed pretty well even in the the match that they lost uh, yesterday, but they. O OC is a guy that right now for them, if he's not, if he's having a bad series, then there's almost no chance that they're going to beat a team that's top 10 status, top 12 status. If, <clears throat> if he is able to hit that 1.2 rating, if he's able to find, you know, six opening kills in a map for his team, then, then they have a, to they totally have a chance to do it because that's something that liquid pretty much never had to work with. They never had an opera who could, who could find any sort of consistency for even the last even during the Grand Slam run, I guess I guess Nitro played pretty well during some of those overpass games, especially for the Grand Slam run. But like, he was never like a dominant opera, though. Right? Exactly. Exactly. What what I've already seen from OC has been, I'd say, better than what Nitro provided. Then I don't think I think that's a very safe assessment too. Yeah. It, it's just that it's just that when he doesn't do well because he's not used to a style that another tier one team brings like some European team they haven't scrimmed against or something, then yeah, he has a chance to falter, and then you with nitro and shocks you just you're just not going to get a lot consistently like shocks shocks sometimes makes one cerebral move per game and it's like oh god like what a sick push that found the flank but he makes a lot of bad moves too he like he really makes a lot of plays that get his team into trouble on top of that so you got to take you got to take like the good with the bad with shocks one thing that is hopeful for the future of liquid is i talked to Elige. i had, bre I had breakfast with Elige, and he talked about like what shocks was bringing for the team and he told me that Basically, Shox is doing a lot in terms of outlining protocols, uh, maybe like game theory stuff, making sure that everybody's on the same page so that essentially when they enter a situation like a 4v4 on a certain map, CT side, they know what's going to be the point of emphasis in the round. What is what is our what is the liquid way of solving this problem now? And I guess for some reason they weren't always doing that before. But regardless, if they're getting on the pa same page, that's cool. I think there's still growth for this liquid team. And, but the problem is that I think a lot of it does just come down to OC. I've got a couple of points on that. First of all, I've just got a couple of jokes. Like one is obviously when Launders said to Shocks, you know, like, and how are you finding speaking in English? Obviously, the, the real joke would have been if he had just turned to the fucking guy and gone like, uh, qu'est-ce que c'est qu'il a dit? <laughs> Which means like, what did he say in French? Like, that would obviously be the fucking straight fire joke. Maybe even do a skit with that. Yes, I'll take notes yeah. already. Then also the other one is, I'm sure the reason he's in this team is if you're someone like fucking Elise, you say, I've always dreamed of playing with Shocks. My answer, it's a shame you're never going to get the chance. <laughs> yeah wow because that's the problem Anger. this is the thing that sucks right now here's what i don't get is first of all i'm with you launders i thought people's take on shocks being bad in vitality is a take that they just like formed in the first six months of the team and then just never got rid of they never updated it like they acted like for the two plus years he was in the team he was just shit he wasn't at all and especially in that last lineup the one where they had this flawed kyojin part he wasn't a problem at all to me dude he actually had found his groove like you're saying and he did it without having half loads of 
was awesome because he was always the fate if you have shocks on your team. Either that he becomes the IGL or he just tries to be the god lurker and take all the resources and he obviously isn't that player anymore. To me, the reason it kills me is because when you look at the fact they kept Masuta in Vitality, which I realise they'll use that angle of like, yes, but all the years in the future we could have him, etc. I think that's getting ahead of yourself, mate. You might have to cut him in like three months. We'll have to mm. see. To me, I thought they got it and that what they were going to do with shocks is he was going to become the new RPK. His role would become just give us experience, consistency, win a few clutches, basically be better than you should be for an old guy not playing in a star role. And then the idea is then we fix the other roles. And like we've got the they've got the core set. You know, for me, if the core of the team was Zemu, Apex, and Shocks, you got a nice flaw there. And now if we could put a couple of other pieces in, we'll cook away gas. To me, when he's gone to liquid, all you've done is make this guy speak English, which he's not comfortable as. Secondly, he is the number one player along with Kenny S, where every interview for seven years is it's never like oh tactically I was in a bad thing or I didn't scout the deck it's always like oh I'm, the way I am feeling in this game though and the, my team adds the energy into matching like they're people who play totally off like emotion vibes feeling they don't it's a different vibe in Team Liquid you can tell that ain't the same sort of team you know so to me I think essentially you've just gotten yourself a worse version of Shocks and I don't really see how he sort of comes out of this because to me He's even sort of in this team almost cynically, just like you've just got one of this leftover fucking positions, haven't you? Like, I don't really know why they did this movement. I almost feel like because they fucked it up with like some of the bigger names they were trying to get, they just wanted like the name. Because at least the name Shocks is like a cool name when you see it on paper. Like, wow, Shocks joined Team Liquid. The problem is, like I say, you just remember like, yeah, but it isn't like four years ago, is it? It's like, if anything, he's only going to be sort of a supportive element anyway, isn't he? Like, maybe he could be a semi lurker. And I agree, definitely. The thing is, you even see it now. You see in Team Liquid, why I want it must stay in vitality because he also no matter what you might say about his fragging his role he is still good for one or two clutches a game and that is I still think that is mad underrated like because he will just get in the ones where it's not like I'm talking about he's winning like a refresh 1v5 but he will just win like the clean 1v2 that plenty of pros would just lose and you know you just take it in fact you don't even blame the guy when he's in that you're like ah oh, well you tried NT you know he wins those and he does it even in like just you can see it's purely off his brain now he's not some god aimer anymore he just outthinks people he always knows where they are he has a great timing for it he makes the right decisive pushes so the problem I have is this I get the feeling some of that might not even translate in team liquid so I don't even know if you ever really get the play you thought you were signing for Vitality. it's a bit of a bummer all around for me that one mate that's like the move out of the wall I can't really forgive the most because the other point I had was this I'm totally fine with them signing OC like again if we're looking who was available like listen unless you are getting like device or someone from Europe to come over that is the best player and I actually think this shows what one of my principles of Counter-Strike is still alive and well boys which is the biggest gap in tier 1 Counter-Strike is AWPA versus AWPA that is the craziest gap and it's even by the way a logical uh, inference from the weapon if Nico fights against Stown in a rifle battle Stown might still do 75 damage and then die if an AWPA fights each other it's binary, isn't it? I kill you and you do nothing to me or you kill me and I do nothing to you. So the problem is, if I really gap you, as it were, to use like league terminology, it's going to be enormous. It's going to look like I dominated you. So think of these three players because all three of them got their tier one job the same exact way. They smurfed tier two. They were way too good for the team they were in. They got the tier one crack and none of them have done it yet. So there's the three players. It's going to be safe. It's going to be smoothia and it's going to be OC. All three of them did the same thing. They were way too good for tier two. They had to get a crack at tier one. But the point I'm going to make is this. I don't think you can take a player like that, drop him in tier one and go, right, become a top 10 player in the world. I think the adjustment period is going to be brutal when you put that guy in that spot. So like, that's why for me, the smoothie one's ridiculous. Like you give him two lands out the door. Like no one knows yet on safe. Luckily, he could, his team's good enough. It seems that like he's going to get the chance to do it. I just hope for liquid. Like if you sign a player like OC, in my opinion, unless you give him at least six months, you didn't sign him in good faith. Like if you thought he was just going to walk in and dominate tier one, you don't know opening Counter-Strike, mate. You, there's very few players will ever do that. Well, I mean, they're they're running from a bear right now, but it's Shocks and Nitro who are the slowest. I don't think OC has that much. No, no, I think it's fine. There. Sure, yeah, that's that's the thing for him. I just worry because fans obviously have hyper focused on that part because he was sort of promised to be the the next carry, wasn't he? Or... Yeah, he he did uh, he did really well in the group stage. I mean, the last the last Bo three that they played, he did not show up. Uh, the problem I've that. noticed, Maui, I want to get your yeah. take on this. Is he's even doing a thing which also in some ways gives me hope, which is. If you ever look at his stats, his stats are misleading because what he does is he either smurfs or he shits the bed. He never, mm -hmm. he doesn't just go, he doesn't just play like seven out of ten. Count. He actually either dominates a map, or, but then the next map he likes to shit the bed completely. 
So to me, in a weird way, I at least like the upside. At least sometimes yeah. he's smurfing, you know? Okay, I have a theory about this. I think that partly the reason he's super inconsistent, because I'm more huge on OC, honestly. the Because like even the, for us in NA watching OC from the last two years, he has improved like 10. Oh, it's way like, better. If people, people don't other, know, dude, I used to say, used to on him you remember when he was in the Cloud9 team? He yeah. was one of the players I told people back then. You do not want to go all in on this player back in like talk like early 2020. Right, I was like, right, that guy right. will get torn up on like I'll get I will say though, if you watched him last year online, he was way better than that. Way, he was probably like two times better, literally. Mm-hmm. But the, the reason that I'm actually uh, huge on him is because like that style that Alicia's has talked about, where he's like tries to basically write out every single reaction to all of his plays, that that actually works in the big game. So when you see okay. him play the on his high highs, it's not as random. Honestly, I'll call it, I, I mean, it's not as random as some like of the more like wildly aggressive players where they just they're just so nuts that they just get lots of kills when oc does it it comes with so many good rotations so many good positional adjustments right. every right nade so when i see the high highs i see sustainable high highs and when i see the lows i see maybe it's just so much preparation like you're saying to come into tier one all these new teams all these new play styles not enough reps but i think that 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 floor will come up with him i'm sure of it Right, we'll I'm, move now. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go on. I mean, yeah, yeah, I was just going to agree with that. I think that he, I mean, he's <laughs> procedural right. in the way that he's improved and that, like, I, I get I get more nervous when I see oppers come up in the space because they just have sick-ass mechanics. I honestly get way more worried about that. Like, yeah. honestly, he's probably one of the lone exceptions, but there's so yes. many, like, like, the Smuya one is basically, like, sick mechanics, but, like, really crappy uh, yeah, exactly. rotations and, and the way that... That's the most yeah. obvious guy's going to get exposed, you know? Yeah, yeah, just, like, re-peaking like a motherfucker. Yeah. Like, that, that doesn't that doesn't pay off in the long run. Yes. Yeah, I mean, in general, as a general rule in couch, like, if people don't know, part of the reason we have tiers is because some people dominate tier two, but they do it by resting on the mechanics. And that obviously is going to immediately be the crutch that gets kicked out when you go to tier one. And yeah. then they're like, yeah, mechanics is kind of our thing in tier one. So let's just smash this guy. So, okay, let's go to the ugly points now. Launders, obviously, as I said, you're going to have to finesse this a little bit. So what, what is your ugly point now going to be? Because we have sort of yeah. harvested this in other people's points, but we'll do what we can. Yeah. Well, to be fair, it's a little bit selfish to me. I, obviously, this is a huge point of interest right now, and that's it's North America. So my my point was going to be North America as the ugly, but more specifically to make it a little different is the fact that everybody's on the wrong teams, and there's not really a good yes. solution for that. So I think right now you have three big teams in Liquid, EG, and Complexity, and if you were to consolidate these players, you could make two solid teams, and right now we have three teams that could never win a tournament right now. But, you know, Liquid might come the closest because they have the most relevant core, Naf and Alish not falling off at all, continue will probably be top 20. OC could join them. That's their moonshot bet. That's a great thing. But still behind that, we see two problems. And then you have Complexity, who have are harboring Floppy, who is a player like OC, where there's so much potential there. We've seen him play so well. You know he's super good on land, like all this potential. Uh, but he's playing on a team that overall doesn't have that much experience. Then you go over to EG and you have players like Stewie who have that kind of experience would be maybe a great second IGL to someone like JT or, uh, and then have players like Cirque and Breeze who would play better under more structure like JT and don't as make, make as much sense on EG. And we're seeing players that would be better on different teams all spread out at the moment and no one in a good position on a team that will win. So you could be the best in an A, but that's still top eight. You know, that's still top eight at a at big event, max. That's that's pretty much the problem right now. And I think uh, one of the most clear ones for me is if Floppy went to Liquid, Liquid would be not just the best NA team. They would be a tournament winning team. That's As in instead of Shocks, is that who we're replacing him with? Yeah, I think that would be the most... The only the main reason, not to, this is not so much shade at Shocks, it's just that simply Nitro is calling. So you, that's just a whole problem with sure. itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think, Mouse? Well, yeah, I mean, Floppy, Floppy right now is the best bitch role player in North America for yeah. sure. Like he, he can take any, he can take any role and actually, he, he basically is like the things that Kerrigan says about Rops that are nice. Like he can just do it, and like you don't have to worry about him. He's just gonna hold his space. He's not gonna like, he's not gonna die, and he might even win you some rounds from from some disadvantageous positions. That's exactly what Floppy is right now for complexity, and they have actually. Well, when I look closer at them, it was when JT was on really high ping at Fun Spark, so I, I can't really that that might be them adjusting their gameplay to when JT had like 180 ping or whatever it was. But he did go second in sometimes with that roster. But like I know the things he does for like like nuke, like lobby lurk. It's like the same thing Rops does. He'll be like the apartments guy on Inferno. Like that's like Rops's role, and and it's clear that he just watches like a lot of demos. And and Floppy is a guy that. 
if if it were one for one, him for shocks, yeah, I think Liquid is almost their floor becomes like twelfth best in the world. Like that's their that's and I I would love to see if they could even go higher than that. Th- yeah, like you said though, the the that'd be the first is, time in history Liquid even had a real opera. Yeah, with a solid team behind it. Yeah, yeah, it would be it'd be really it'd be really cool to see. But yeah, like you said, the problem is that how do you even make these these moves change? It has to be post major. That's that's basically it. It has to be after the RMR. Has to be after the major. So I think we're in a kind of a, a holding period for the next two months to see does anybody overperform and then they like the wor- almost the worst thing that can happen for North America is for like a complexity to make it to like top six top top 12 or something at this major and then they're like oh let's just keep it for way longer but if every na team bombs then there's, there's yeah. going to be they're going to pull the trigger on some moves and i would like to see that more than a short-term success give me the give me something that's going to work in the long run mm-hmm. the funny thing is i actually think the most obvious move just like anyone would make is the igl position on eg like that's the way you potentially transform that like if it hadn't been jt the other one and people know this potentially was on the table was daps what if yeah. Daps had been the ad- he's obviously played with a bunch of these guys anyway. So to me, that would have been a slam dunk. Again, provide a bit of structure, get the team figured, probably even figure out some of the roles for some of the guys that maybe are a bit lost in the past or they're, they're just delusional about what their skill set is now. I think the other one for me as well was that's also why JT didn't seem to me to fit the complexity lineup as much. Like, even though I think the players in complexity, they've done a great job gathering all the NA talent, basically. But the problem they have in that team is there's a bunch of people who, in theory, are supposed to be your star on your team. And then you've got an IGL who obviously was OC and Floppy's IGL. But when he was on that team, they were running like hard executes out of fucking yeah. spawn guys. And yeah. they were doing shit like it was all based around everyone hitting the timings. It's like they can't play that with this team. Like, he's got like a pog team now basically so the problem there is I just think you've got a mismatch in terms of like I'm with you uh, Launders people might think like ah who gives a fuck about JT he's actually a decent IGL he's just more of like sort of a playbook IGL to me you know so you want you want to have people who understand structure man if we didn't have JT we would have no structure based IGLs in the whole region at all I mean just even having different styles to come into practice with is huge because like there was a whole conversation the rhetoric right now in NA is that like oh NA teams they love to end the round as early as possible at least you have an IGL like JT you're not going to play into that and just be another team that tries to end around in 20 seconds they'll force other teams to think of different styles and that's the only thing that's going to really help the whole region so you know obviously the problem is twofold you can make two probably solid teams out of the three we have right now but then also you don't have enough new talent to come in like Europe has everything from uh, tons yeah, of, of players, like 6,000 ELO players on face it, plus Academy League level players and Academy Leagues for them to feed into. And we're not even close to that. So unfortunately, it feels like we're just spread too thin. And then the other one for me is, it just seems obvious to me that like, if you're EG, you should have taken one of the complexity fucking stars. Like yeah. you can't just have only fucking yeah. boomers from 2018 and 2019. Like just take one, take the one you think's the best. You would definitely say yes, they would join. And then at least then you have a contingency at the moment. They just, like I say, they're, ho- they're waiting for everyone to find their form. It's crazy. <laughs> but yeah, that's right, let's, mo- it, yeah. let's move it on then. Cause here's the thing. Maui's also got one that we might have essentially cannibalized earlier on as a point. So what do you either want to go with this one or we go with a different angle? What's your point going to be for ugly here, Maui? Uh, well, okay. So my, my original one was that just that it's like really obvious now. I think that we know heroic ceiling. So basically, I think before we sort of talked about maybe slightly more structural things. Okay. But now now it's almost just like to me with, with heroic... It, it's kind of like the way I perceive this team isn't really like I just know what they are to almost a fault at this point where they're they're going to keep uh, they're going to keep messing up once they reach top eight, top four of a tournament, top six, whatever it is, you know, quarterfinals, um, big game matches. And so, like, I think you you pose like a cool uh, what if on Twitter, Thorin, about who would the roster like, what would a cool Danish roster be like? Yeah, I think you need to. I really think with uh, this heroic lineup now, you either aspire to have this, like you have like a, a a complete change, like you swap out two players and just go with a like you could potentially fall out of the top seven with if you do this move, or you just go for a home run move. Like you either need to like you just need to take a huge, huge, huge risk, and I feel like that's kind of where heroic are as a team, and I, I it's kind of rough like. 
Again, like nobody's going to make any moves till after the major at this point because they're probably going to make it to the major. They're probably even going to make playoffs. But it's just like barring some miracle run where they actually make it to the finals and don't just choke a quarters or semis. It's it's so hard to see this team ever doing anything else in that. And sometimes it's like very it's very obvious that teams just need a mentality change like. Like, you know, the the Stannis law for daps kind of change that always happens where it's like, yeah, that team's like always it's right there. But like you just need to give it this one extra little boost to make it. And it, it's almost like remember how Ents basically did that thing where they kicked Alexi B. They brought in Sonny. They needed the time to strike when the iron was hottest was was in that first three months. If they were able to take the structure of Ents and then they were able to just slot in a better player, that's when they had a chance to actually win something. I almost feel like that's the case right now for Heroku. You need to just use the same playbook that you have right now with Kadian, just slight tweaks, slight adjustments, bring in a much better op, bring in a better opper, basically, and then just see if you can win a tournament. And and that's probably it. That's probably the life of the roster right there for me. For me, I, I don't really know where else you go with it. Yeah, we, we tried an example from another Danish team with Astralis, like back when they cracked it, like they were top four at every event, right? Like that yeah. was the thing. Like they, they were always like almost the favorite coming into the event and got top four consistently. And you knew his mental kind of feels the same way for Heroic. But their change wasn't even a firepower upgrade, right? It was just an IGL uh, IGL swap to bring Glaive in. That was just a mental change. But I agree that like basically anyone can do it. No one knows. This stuff is so hard to see from the outside if you ask them because they, you know, when they posture publicly and stuff like that, they just talk about how much they love each other and how good they are Gosh. and how much they love their captain and everything like that. But then like, I'm sure, I mean, you, you like look at their land results. Like they, it's very clear that that's the difference. So I don't know exactly what you could change. And it's very uncomfortable to want to change a heroic player because they've all shown such high yeah, highs on different days. But it seems like just the problems start from the top. I even hate having to think about it because here's the problem. When they play well, I like the whole team. It's one yeah. of the teams I actually enjoy. I even love that they're a great example to Counter-Strike fans that you don't have to have like the old structure I always had of like the two stars. and the th like They actually are a team where everyone does their job and does it like just well enough to make the strats work and make the calls, work, which then makes you win. And then, okay, now Stowns emerges as a star, but they didn't even need that before to be a world-class team. They actually had just amazing, well-rounded unit. It's like a great example of like younger players, how you can band together together form your own identity but here's my problem as so i saved this point from earlier because i knew we were going to do this at the end when i said earlier i made that video at the end of last year which was sort of to try to say to fans like you know don't bill on them now like look like yeah they fucked up a couple of lands but you know look at the map pool look at the potential look at other teams that are gonna you know be having a period where they're not as good when they make a roster move here's the problem that was like four or five months ago now I've now seen they didn't capitalize. They, their window's gone. Their window was from the beginning of the major to basically like now. Like This should have been when you got the majority of your, your wins done. The other teams made their roster moves. You already had a top team anyway. You had all the map pool. You've got your experience online. You've played all the... Like, if you were going to win, it would have happened by now. So not only do they not get very high placings, but quite frankly, I'm out on them now. Like, I don't just stick around forever, guys. Like, even with the Astralis team, like, I have to have times where I go, right, you've got to show me again before I'm coming back yeah. in on this deal like i was willing to all in on it at the end of last year but now i would just say cash out i've had look i had a nice run they had a period where they were cool but i also and this is the last thing i would say the reason i don't look and i, and I actually do think the window is now closed is because this is now when all the teams that made the roster move starts to solidify like god forbid vitality gets good you better hope fucking monacy can't stay in g2 if face clan really is this good if yeah. Furtis pro can stay playing together if gambit isn't after split you're just in you've got no fucking chance you are going to win any of these lands like you need everything to go wrong for everyone else and even when it has it i haven't won the land yet you haven't won so i have to say i'm sort of out i, I know it sucks because i do like him as a team but it's like i've seen two, essentially they just consistently fail in the same way each time and that just that just kind of blows to me you know yeah i i yeah i'm with that 100 percent. just yeah it's like the same people kept saying about gambit like oh they're not they're not online it seems like the definition of onliner is if the online results don't transfer to land it's the exact same game it's literally you're playing the yes. same game in the same server on the same maps versus the same teams literally the only difference is the pressure that's the difference so if gambit make top four at every land but got top one for the first every event for the first six months of the year then they are officially onliners like yes. they could be top four of the major. It doesn't matter if they were supposed to win that. They would have won that major when it was online. If they won Cato when it was online, but couldn't do it online. Yeah, yeah. That's the difference. That's the difference.
Yeah, obviously the problem is fans just hear that you are online and go, you're saying he's shit online. It's like, he didn't yeah. say that, did he? He just, you know, it's a fucking distinction, and it? It's the same as the words overrated or underrated, the most yeah. cursed words in the history of analysis. Because obviously I always use them. Listen, I know what I'm doing. I do use it where like, you know, like if he was the second best player and you say he's the first, I'm like, he's so overrated. And then they're like, what the fuck? It's like, listen, in the court of law, I would win. Unfortunately, I keep putting myself in a court of public opinion. So essentially, if you all decide I lose, I lose, so... I'll block you. There you go. Whatever. That's just a joke. <laughs> it's not a joke, actually. It's just a veiled joke. It's a threat. I will block you. So tweet at me. I'll block you. But if, let's be real. You're already blocked. So get on Thorin's Purgatory, that wicked side account I've made for all you fucking plebeians, and just see a screenshot of my tweet with the backdrop of me just laughing, like, <laughs> just in your face, because I want it to be humiliating when you view my tweets. Anyway... Yes. So here's the last point, okay, my ugly point. I've got to bang it here because I think this is just... Pr- I'm always very careful, Lordis, to not make it so there's too much... Like, there shouldn't be too much blur for me usually between the bad and the ugly point. I want it to, like, ugly for a good reason, you know. It's not just, like, a, a, not, as, a not as bad, bad point. This is ugly to me. Alex's fucking career. It's just ugly. It's not bad. In some oh. ways, it's good. It's just ugly because fucking hell, this guy cannot catch a break. Every time he zigs, he should have zagged. So he leaves. First of all, he kicks NBK when they're one of the best teams in the world. Okay, maybe this can work out. We're even pretty good still. Still don't get to number one. All right? You better just bench yourself and say you're not playing anymore. Then you go to Cloud9. Wow, a whole project built around you. You're even doing a really good job. All your stars fall to shit. They get kicked immediately. You have to now hope, unironically, that the star players of fucking the old NA South African Cloud9 and fucking Chaos have to carry you against Na'Vi, Faze. Like, that's ridiculous. And you are then judged and told, told you are shit when you lose in three maps or 16-14 to the aforementioned Na'Vi, Faze, Vitality, like the best teams in the world. Then he comes to Fnatic. Wow, he turns a, a dying franchise around. He actually does what Cloud9 couldn't do. He makes the Fnatic name relevant again. He's even got people like Smoo in great form. Of course, that lineup implodes to where it looks like you're just making one move for behavioral reasons, but someone doesn't know how fucking chess works and is doing other moves at the same time you're doing your one move it's like as you're trying to take a pawn they're just like fucking sacrificing a bishop and then moving like a fucking knight out and you're like what what so suddenly you've not only lost smoothie you've lost brawlan crims is probably just gonna fucking retire or go elsewhere now now you're using standings and you're you're literally going like please peps or can i have a relevant <laughs> give me a break like how oh, curse is this guy's career he's even by the way still doing a good job now with motherfucking standings even getting to the playoffs <laughs> epl yes. and if you ever watch individually every time his lineups go to shit he actually frags off decent for an IGL so like motherfucker this guy has such a cursed career I feel like in any one of these teams it could have gone so differently and he would actually have like mad status as an IGL by now whereas instead I get the feeling the fan obviously a very like simplistic analysis their analysis I think is like he got carried by Zebu and then he shit since then isn't he it's like he really isn't he seems to me like actually a very good IGL I, yeah the, this the the worst thing that happened to Alex in his career was letting the buzzword of burnout get to him. <laughs> like if <laughs> And he did it. Remember, he he remember this is the best part of all I forgot I should have mentioned that one is the ultimate zig when you should have zagged is you go you know what? We've just come out of a very busy late 2019. This land schedule, I can't handle yeah, it. I'm exactly, benching myself. Exactly. Two months later, the whole world, there are no more lands. Oh, shit, I've left the team. Already. Like That yeah, might yeah. be the craziest zig when you should have zagged them all the time. Yeah, Everyone true. was going to get the whole year off. Yeah, that's, exactly, <laughs> that's actually insane, isn't it? That's actually insane. That's exactly yeah, what I was referring to. Holy shit. He just, he just, he just chose the worst time to take a break when, when everybody's that. like, ah, oh, burnout, burnout this, burnout this. Yeah. It's, like, it's like you'll You'll basically, if you hear, if you don't know what depression is, you'll be like, ah, fuck. Like, I'm just, I'm just kind of like not feeling myself right yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. I can't put my finger on what yes. this is right now. And he, but once he figured out what burnout was, he's like, that's what I'm experiencing. And then that's why he dipped out. <laughs> that is wild. Yeah. I didn't even thought of the timeline on that. Is that so nuts, isn't it? I love what Alex brings, honestly, as an IGL. I think he's pretty creative. I think his teams always look unique. And I think Zywoo is like somebody who helped his team be like probably more relevant than they would have been without him. But that's any team Zywoo plays on. Even right now with True. Apex, we talk about how good Apex is an IGL. Zywoo is still miles ahead of his next best teammate. So that's not, I don't think that was fair to Alex. And I think that on Cloud9 as well, 
they kept it competitive with good teams. Like you have to contextualize Cloud Nine because they had really good matches uh, in their in their like sh very short amount of time together. And honestly, you could blame players like Waxic more than you know you could blame players like Alex. I think for what happened with the roster. So I I uh, yeah, that's a that's a good one because it has been really messy for him, and um, it's sad that you know people highlight that you can win with stand-ins to talk about how good you are, but that is a pretty, pretty impressive. So here's how you know that like, realistically there are no Pyrrhic victories. That's just something you tell yourself to not feel as bad. Cause if Pyrrhic victories are real, then he had like a fucking Pyrrhic era with cloud nine. Like how many fucking times were they almost winning that game against everyone? It was mental, wasn't it? But the yeah. joke is they would actually like convert. Like I'm going to say something mad. Like I think it was, no joke. It was like 15% of those games. They ever like converted into a win. Like they were just the team. You just bet your house on, the other team when it was 14 14 or 14 you were like they're not winning this shit like it was mental on it i've never i've genuinely by the way i'll flip it the other way around Do you know what i said about heroic where i've never seen a team that should have been so good and so complete just underwhelmed so much they were the team that on paper especially those late cloud nine lineups they had no business even being in these matches like, they should have just been going zero five in every poor league group but as i say they would always be like a fucking hair away from the win and to me it's like I've said this to fans before. Who do you think was doing that? It obviously wasn't bloody Zeppa, was it? Like, it wasn't fucking Essatag. It was fucking Galax, wasn't it? Yeah. He clearly was. The, he was even the opera in that team, for fuck's sake. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> the roster there, I think people will look back at now and be like, oh, well, he should have been close. But, like, the thing is, the, the best performers on that team, I mean, it was the best performer was Floppy statistically back on that roster. And people are like, oh, he had Floppy, but, like, Floppy wasn't even he as was good as he is new. now. Oh, that was being yeah, floppy. And, 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 yeah. Mezzi, and Mezzi was still developing as a player. Like, Mezzi is a really, really solid player now. But on that one, he was like, yeah, he could be, like, a good player one day, but he was not that player yet, two years Oh, ago. mate, there's another brutal example. So normally, when you're a great IGL or really good IGL, one of the hardest pieces to nail down actually is that, like, sort of support development or, like, an entry player and to have them your whole career. This guy's just found, literally, like, the yeah. most found money of all time. I always say Henry G should get mad props for signing that guy because he has turned out to be way better than he should be. And consistently, he's even now, if people don't know, transition fucking roles, he's still really good. Like, yeah. He actually, low, low joke, he can frag as well. Like, he's like so the idea, you've had him this whole time, but it also doesn't bloody work because then all the other pieces move in and out all the time. Oh, it's a fucking nightmare. Yeah, mate. I can't handle it. It does my head in completely. Yeah, Mezzi kind of went back to star, but he. I think maybe that's one mistake Alex made in the with the original Cloud Nine lineup was that like you know maybe you couldn't put Mezzi as the star right away, but like the earlier he did that, maybe the better, the faster Mezzi would have bloomed because he obviously they signed him because he was the star player of his last lineup and that he was really good on paper. So I don't know, if you don't really hand someone to the keys over that quickly, but at the same time they forced him to be a totally different player and he showed how versatile he was by surviving that. But now he's coming back into being a, a really, you know, high impact player and doing well doing that. Maybe they should have just trusted him to do that from the beginning. This video was kindly supported by Ahmed Hadju, Matt Pugnacio Ragula, Travis Goff, Adam Oaks, Animosity, Butt Pounder 420, Hades, Jensen Gore, Joseph Ginsburg, Kovacevic, Tobias Bernasconi, Tukan, William Peyton Lacey, Zumba, Xyrathenia, and a special thanks always goes up to Jerky's Minion. Want to suggest a topic or a guest? Want to ask a question in my monthly AMA? I promise they're coming. Want teasers for my upcoming content? Would you like to be in one of those lengthy donated discussions with me? Well, if any of the above tickles your fancy or the other perks available, put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today where in the description box below.